Good morning and welcome to today's virtual bridge session, which is going to be uh, about managing online sessions. Um, today it's going to be a double act between myself and Kenji from College Development Network and we're going to talk through uh, two areas about managing online meetings and also managing online, online classes. Now Kenji, how are we going to manage this? <laughs> That's the, the, the $64,000 question. So it's it's an imperfect science. So I think that what we're going to share with you today is based on our joint experience of, of working within this medium. So to explain, my background is I'm, I'm an English teacher. Uh, that's how I started out, um, primarily within ESOL. And I taught in Canada, in Hong Kong, and, and mostly in Japan as well for, for a, a long period of time before coming back to the UK and kind of transitioning into educational technology. So while I was in Japan, one of my roles was to establish a distance learning uh, school, uh, teaching languages, six languages at the time. And I had a, a core staff of around 40 teachers um, who were all, 10 were based actually within uh, Japan, but a, a large number of my teachers were outside of the country. So everything was done remotely. When we connected for staff meetings, we would connect remotely. Uh, when we did staff training and when we met with also the branch schools that were connected with the private school I was working with, we had 240 branch schools uh, across Japan. So we regularly met uh, online. Initially, we, we would have telephone conference meetings. This is going back almost 20 years, but we transitioned into to online uh, VC meetings. Um, so I've had a lot of experience working within that medium. And as part of that, I did teach online. I, I taught a lot of sessions using a, a variety of software systems. And, and that's been the case for, well, almost 20 years now. So that's my background. That's my justification to say this basically from that, this is, this is what I've distilled from that. And this is what I think uh, works in that medium. Okay, and um, I'll just say, well, I'm a lawyer by background and so I'm fairly uh, into meetings, but um, I think I've had a cause uh, over many years of career to reflect on the purpose uh, of meetings and, uh, and reflect on indeed their quality. And I think if you've spent any time in any sector, you'll have had meetings which are better than others. And there's no difference between physical meetings and online meetings in that respect. Uh, online meetings, of course, gives you certain capabilities, but it comes with certain risks as well of highlighting uh, some of the things that might be wrong with in-person meetings and to be quite frank where it's likely that we're all going to spend quite a lot of time in meetings so for them to be effective is important and, and they can be a vehicle for getting things done um, I, admittedly, I was, um, I think, driven by a quote from, I believe it was Mark Twain once upon a time, who said, for a committee to be effective, it should be composed of no more than three members, two of whom should be absent. And um, I think we've all been in those sort of situations. But um, of course, a meeting is a way of calling upon uh, the collective mind and coming to a synergy of ideas and, and work that forward. And so I think it's important to set a structure um, that gets you there. Now, Kenji, are we going to go over to our compare our top tips then? And yes, yeah, so so we have we have two sets. So should we we should probably try and take this in order. And so for everyone to understand then. So the first part of the session is where we're going to talk about managing online meetings. So uh, whether whether you're chairing those or, or simply facilitating or managing those um, meetings in the first instance. And once we've talked through that. There will be some overlap, obviously, but then we'll talk about managing um, a, a classroom environment, a virtual classroom environment. So we, we've both prepared uh, a set of slides. I absolutely believe that Jason's <laughs> will be superior. So I'm going to let him go first and, and, and then I'll you know, be scared and intimidated for mine. So Jason, let's, okay. let's share your slides and see yeah, what you have as your top three. Yeah, okay, well, I'm not going to share them by uh, slide sharing. What I'm going oh, to right. do is put them up on my video, in fact. So if you're not aware of it, then you can click on my photo and get or, or hover over it and pin my video so you can see it. Otherwise, it might appear very small. And here we have it then, my three top tips then for managing online meetings. The first is if you are the manager, the facilitator, the chair of a, the meeting, and then it's about imposing a structure to it. 
uh, setting the time available and actually trying to make sure that everyone gets to put in their their perspective and their inputs. Um, so that does mean some degree of preparation in terms of agenda. I found it quite as a, just a practical tip, um, starting off uh, rather than some, I, I don't know how many meetings I've been to where the agenda item basically amounts to discuss something. And of course, we live in a world with many intelligent people with a lot of experience and ability to reflect and an awful lot of things could be talked over for hours by a number of people. Of course, we also live in a world where some people are more used to speaking than others. And uh, I, I'm very prone to, uh, to being able to speak for a long time. And that's not really the best way to get everyone's input. Uh, so it could be about uh, starting an agenda item, asking everyone to use the hands up item, for example, to see if they want to speak to that item. And if you've got 15 minutes to discuss something and 10 people have got their hands up, then you know you're going to have to negotiate with the group perhaps about who gets to put in their input and how long. So that the structure and control to make sure everyone can be involved, first of all. Secondly, focus on purpose. I reflect on in-person meetings which were effective and one person that I knew uh, used to come along to meetings as a chair with the minutes already written. It wasn't a way of precluding uh, discussion or changing those, but it was a starting point. And I think one powerful uh, method is actually, uh, rather than agenda items driving the meeting, proposals driving the meeting. And so, and that's a way of getting, making sure that the uh, purpose is met and decisions are taken. So you can't be left at the end of an agenda item or, or a, an item to be considered in the meeting uh, with just general chat. You, you come to something definite. Um, and thirdly, use the chat pane. Uh, we all know that, um, again, there are certain things about um, well, in-person meetings, especially the loudest person, um, the most forceful person, often gets far more say than those who might be more reflective. Those who are quick also get a say. So um, the chat pane is a good way to enable inclusion and to draw people in who might not otherwise engage. And for me, those are my three top tips. Yes, now, now I'm thinking I should have really seen your tips before you're out. I'm going to show, <laughs> share mine. So, okay, okay. Um, I, I, I think we'll, we'll go through mine and then we'll have a bit of a discussion around, I may, I may even quiz you on some of the points that you raised there. Uh, so let me, let me share <laughs> my tips. Then I'm, I'm going to share because you know, I'm I'm a simple soul. That's that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I, I suppose for meetings, um, I am a I'm a fairly lazy person, um, and I I enjoy I enjoy things that are productive. I like the best use of time. So I I, I like to concentrate activity in as, as short a space of time as possible. And online meetings for me, to a certain extent, accomplish that. I find that you can do more with an online meeting and they're much more equitable because everyone's coming in in the, the same sort of way, although they may not have the experience of working in that medium. But essentially, a lot of what Jason said, I, I would certainly agree with. For me, my first point, and I try to squeeze more than one point into each of my points, notice that, <laughs> it's, it's true. I, I do believe in a clear uh, agenda, an agenda that is set out. And obviously every meeting comes with some kind of agenda. It's unlikely that you'd ever turn up to a meeting without an agenda. I noticed that in, in a face-to-face -face setting, people will often print out an agenda and leave it in front of them during the meeting. So having that clearly displayed throughout the process is something that I find practically helps in a meeting. So usually the first slide that I would show is an agenda of what we're setting out to do um, and what we're going to talk through. Now that, that works in a number of ways. One, it also establishes what the goals are for this particular meeting in the same way, that you want to set out what it is you want to accomplish. I also find that in a practical way, I usually add times because time management is something that I honestly struggle with. If you've joined some of our previous sessions, you'll understand that. Now, I think that when you put the agenda up, it clearly sort of displays to everyone involved what the timings are for each subject that's going to be discussed. And if you need to keep to a time, because in this kind of situation, 
people are working to pretty crowded schedules and they, they do have a, a lot of online commitments that they need to keep to. So it's not as relaxed as when you're traveling to some re remote location, sitting down in a meeting, and you could probably spare an extra half an hour or 40 minutes later to have a bit of a chat. So my first tip is to set an agenda which includes the goals for the meetings, the purpose, and also to have that displayed almost throughout the meeting, always coming back to the agenda, displaying it in between the various discussions to show what you're moving on to, to see what's coming up next, and also to highlight the timing of that. And I find that approach really helps with keeping to time and keeping people focused. The, the second thing is protocols. Now, Generally in meetings with, with staff meetings, uh, meeting with lecturers, meeting with external groups, if it's the first meeting, it's quite important to establish a protocol in the sense of how does one interrupt to ask a question? And so you may need to make it clear as to whether you want people to uh, ask for the mic, as it were, uh, either by, by raising a virtual hand in a meeting or, or by, by perhaps typing something into the the chat window. That's, that's a really important step, I find. And once everyone understands that, then things pr proceed much more quickly. And then if you're having a regular uh, series of meetings, then that only happens once, really, uh, unless you need to repeat it for, for new people that are joining a meeting for the first time. But as long as everyone understands the protocol, you find that things move a lot more smoothly. Now, um, my, my final thing, or my third, and these, these are not an exhaustive list of things that I would do, but at the end, I, I think if you have a meeting, and if it lasts for, one would ideally hope no longer than an hour, unless for some extraordinary reason you need more time, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that attention can waver. And, and that you can be distracted, things can happen in your environment, you, you are sitting and staring and listening in a screen for an extended period of time. One would hope that there, there is some interaction. And I, certainly within the classroom sort of set of tips, one of the things is that you, you need to make sure that everyone has a say. So to a certain extent, one of the other things we'll discuss is about participation. But at the end of a session, I think one of my most important things is to go through the actions of the purposes of the meeting, and then essentially ensure that everyone understands what they're expected to do after the meeting. Like if you've set a series of action points and that people are assigned to do things, make sure that everyone's on the same page at the end of the meeting. It's almost like summarizing, but it's just to ensure that people have followed along throughout, <laughs> that someone's not just <laughs> missed the fact that they've been volunteered to do something 40 minutes into the meeting and they've just tuned back in in the last 10 minutes. Uh, that is surprisingly a very important step to, to meetings. So yep, set an agenda helps to keep the timing, establish those protocols, and make sure what the purposes are and what you're expected to do at the end. So yes, those are my three tips. As Jason unmutes himself. I just have to find which of my windows the unmute button is, and that's always a good top tip as well. Okay, we'll briefly go over into the managing classes tips then before opening out for greater discussion. Oh. And um, I'll just- I, I, I should say that Frank posted a really good tip that in, in he, you could copy and paste the agenda into the chat window, potentially, as, as a good way of everyone having a copy of that physical agenda. Now, it, it, it kind of depends on how you plan to use the chat window in meetings. Often, if, if everyone has connected, and I like to encourage people to connect potentially with a video so that you can see them, because it has that, like, even just now, I'm really impressed by the Zoom sort of interface in that we can see a lot of people. You get the impression that you're in a room with people. And that's, that's a lovely sort of experience to have. It's, it's, it's really nice, especially in these times. And you can see that um, platforms like MS Teams has just moved from only showing uh, four simultaneous video feeds to nine video feeds. Uh, Google has just recently moved from, again, up to 16 simultaneous video feeds. And I think that that feeling is really important. So if you're just going to be talking and using that, then the chat window, and you're not actively using the chat window, 
Um, because if you do, then obviously text moves up and down and you lose what you've posted in there. Having that space and placing an agenda in there is an excellent idea, Frank. Uh, I, I'm completely stealing that one. <laughs> okay, over to my tips then for managing online classes. Uh, three quick ones here. And actually from my career as a lecturer in higher education, I think it summarized by um, reminding myself uh, to a greater extent, it isn't about me, it's about the learner. And um, so my top three tips are, first of all, start with the learning experience and the whole design and thinking about it. As, uh, online, ask yourself, what are you expecting the participants to be doing and what are you likely to be doing? If it's a case of, and I uh, can be uh, reflecting back very guilty of this, if it's sit for one hour listening to me talk, that is not going to be a great experience, That's, um, no matter how good uh, that I try to be. Uh, so, uh, so, so ask yourself then, what um, are you expecting the learner to do? And also what options are you giving the learners? And that like, comes uh, on to question two, design for flexibility and adaptability, including looking at um, the, the mood of it all. And um, if we had a little bit longer at the moment, I might get you to use the voting buttons to give thumbs up or thumbs down. Part of the etiquette of uh, uh, on the, the protocol of the class might be um, making sure that students are, feel comfortable about um, intervening, if you like, um, and even getting them to say that they want a break and such like. Um, so try and offer different ones. So for example, if we had a bit longer in this session, we might have had 10 minutes of us talking and then we might have gone away for 10 minutes either for you to go and explore materials or to join a group discussion and then come back for five minutes for a plenary. And that will give you a choice of activity in the middle, depending on how you prefer to learn. And thirdly, let learners help each other. Um, learners do get on very well as, in terms of peer learning. Uh, Kenji had a very good example of that yesterday using groups uh, and breakout rooms in, um, in this platform. Um, so you make the best use of the platform you've got to enable students to learn off each other. That's a powerful way of learning rather than learning off the person who already knows it, the lecturer at the front. Over to you, Kenji. Oh, I was just typing into the chat. Oh, this is where I get to share my my screen again. <laughs> Another comedy moment for you all. Uh, oh, I'll just go with the whole screen. Never, never share your whole screen because um, you never know what's <laughs> when you leave your Outlook open afterwards. Okay, so th this is I, I like I like the online teaching, and and so there 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 are lots of things I can say about online teaching, um, and I could rattle on for ages. Please, please stop me. I mean, please, please stop me. Even though I do like the sound of my own voice, I. I which is probably why You've I'm got three minutes. Oh, see, facilitator. So my, my top three things about um, <laughs> managing online classes, and this is not about the liver, delivery of the content that's inside, inside of it. I think if you're teaching uh, a series of lessons, for example, you've got a scheduled set of lessons over a period of time. The important thing for all students is to get used to the way of how things are going to go. So where possible, establish a consistent format to your delivery. Like if you start off by doing, right, we're going to review the work that I set to you in, in the first 10 minutes. We're going to do a short 10 minute presentation of I'm going to tell you uh, some, some new information. We're going to do an interactive exercise and we're going to finish off with a discussion. If you have some kind of format, stick with it. Because it's that kind of consistency that helps students to understand what to expect when they come into a lesson. I mean, it is, there is a, a question of being more informal. Um, and th there are certain things I'd like to say about how you ease people into this kind of new medium of working. There are, there are some important tips. But ultimately, over the longer term, that kind of consistency for your students really helps. And you'll know that from face-to-face -face teaching uh, in the way that lessons are structured. Sometimes you, it, it won't always suit every occasion, depending on the subject that you teach. But for many people, having a simple, consistent format to online delivery really, really helps students understand what they're expected to do and the level of participation that they're expected to um, engage with or offer. Alongside that, I've mentioned before establishing protocols. If students want to interrupt and ask a question, then they should be clear on the process of doing that. And that's a question of um, they, they can raise their hand, uh, they type into chat or whatever protocol that you want to use in whatever medium, but everyone should have a clear understanding of those protocols. So 
The next thing is <clears throat> coming, similar to what Jason had said, when you come to teach online and your students join you, you don't want it to be a wholly passive experience. Now, I've, I've heard that lecturers are delivering lessons of anything between 30 minutes and 90 minutes. Uh, and 90 minutes is a tough, tough call. 90 minutes online, depending on what you're doing. So one of the important things for me is to make sure that everybody contributes in that session. And, and how do you do that? Well, the, there are a number of ways. Like one of the things that I was taught as a teacher um, to engage students in the physical classroom is that in the first lesson, I should um, talk to each person in the room by name. <laughs> I have the worst memory and <laughs> that's a terrible thing to ask me to do. But so I used to like scribble down the names of everybody where they were sitting and throughout my, my lesson, I'd make sure that I'd say Jack <laughs> or Tomohiro or <laughs> and, and call them by name so that they felt that there was a personal connection with me. Now, I, I tried to translate that onto online delivery too. I want to make sure that everybody has a chance to contribute. And that's by taking over the camera and being the primary speaker and responding back to a, a question or a task. And in, in order to do that, the, there are a number of practical ways. I, I keep a list sometimes of the students that I have physically in front of me and I tick off the number of times that a person has engaged in a lesson. And I want to ensure that everyone speaks at least once in my lesson and has some kind of positive engagement. Because it's, it's often that you, you will have in a class somebody who likes to speak, somebody like me who loves the sound of their own voice and just kind of dominates that whole area. But it's really important that students are really creating the confidence in them to speak out in front of others. These are like presentation skills. These are soft skills that are really, really important. And it's a good opportunity to engage with that. So for me, managing the online class, having students having the expectation that they'll be called upon also helps to managing the whole process because they're more attentive. They expect to be called upon and the whole session as a result goes much more smoothly. Now, I, I was thinking about a third tip and it's a silly one. <laughs> I have to say, or it, it sounds somewhat superficial. Um, I, I would say, uh, look into the camera. Looking into the camera is a thing. And, and part of that is about positioning the camera, about where it is. And if you have a laptop, sometimes the camera is pointing up at you. Uh, we have a really interesting sort of nostril view. Um, <laughs> but in, in this distance learning, connecting with people is a really important thing. And I, I know some people are hesitant about potentially showing their face on screen, but it's, it's you, you know, being a teacher ultimately is, is about the relationships you establish with your students. And, and having people talk to people is the most important part of that process. So showing your face, looking into the camera is really important. Now, the other part of that, having said that, given that you're giving other people the chance to speak and participate in the class, another important aspect is a camera is always pointing to you. So Fiona, I can see that you're writing at the side and writing notes. <laughs> I can tell when people are not engaged and not looking at me. I mean, you know, inside I die a little. <laughs> and it's the same for your students. It's, it's when they're speaking, always remember that there's a camera pointing to you. And the chances are someone will notice if you look away. So um, if possible, always make sure that you're looking at the camera and you look engaged. I mean, you, you know what it is. People, people love to have the feeling that they're being listened to and that people are noticing them. So it's important. The camera is there to show you, but also to show others that they're being listened to. So I would say if you're managing the classroom, having that presence is really important. And that would be my third tip. Thank you. Uh, um, we shall go on to, uh, we've got time for a couple of questions before we bring the formal session to an end, and there may be discussion after that indeed. Uh, a couple of good tips there from Nader, and I'll go over to the chat pane, uh, recommending, uh, signing one of the participants as the moderator who can read the messages and relay them to the speaker. And again, a double team for doing online sessions is often good in that way. Um, and he also adds um, that um, for his meetings, he assigns a student, and of course that uh, democratization and inclusion uh, of the student certainly helps 
um, and it controls the interactivity so everyone's engaged. Um, excellent matter. Um, are there any further questions that anyone would like to unmute and come in to, uh, to tell us? Uh, one, sorry, go ahead, anyone else? Boyan? Go ahead, Nader. Uh Regarding what Kenji mentioned lastly, regarding the video, I tend to ask my students as much as I'd like to see them and see the interaction on their faces so I can gauge their uh, engagement. But we need to be worried about the bandwidth at the moment as well. So I tend to ask my students always to switch their cameras off. So to reduce the bandwidth requirement, that way we don't put too much pressure on the system and other lecturers can uh, engage with their students too. So as much as I like to see them, while I'm presenting, I ask them to switch their cams off. And only during that question and answer session or discussions, the cameras are back on. I, I, I agree. So th there are going to be some technical limitations. So sometimes, especially if you're working with students that are remotely distributed that don't have the best bandwidth, sometimes you have to modify your delivery to, to accommodate that. Um, a couple of things I just, I want to quickly throw in as, as just genuine tips that I sometimes use is in the past, I, I had a very simple system. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was to make sure that everybody had a turn. So some of the simple things that I did were, you, sometimes you have a raise hand uh, <laughs> um, icon that in, in your kind of chat service. Sometimes I got all of my students to raise their hands and I, I would automatically put their hand down every time that they interacted so that I could keep track to see who had actually contributed to the session. So uh, give everyone an opportunity to ask a question, present an idea, whatever it was. And sometimes that's a good way if you don't have pen and paper and you don't want to be distracted by writing while you're listening to a session. Uh, other simple techniques that you'll, you'll definitely know of are, um, and, and don't involve the same kind of bandwidth, is when you get uh, a task and you want students a group of students at random to contribute. You ask one student to say something and you ask them to nominate another student in the class <laughs> to follow up with another question or contribution. And you can do those, you know, simple tactics of chain questions to get a variety of people in. It's nice to randomize that. In, in primary schools, I've seen them use, um, there's a special tool on class tools, which is basically a big spinning wheel with names and every time they say right I'm going to ask somebody in the class a question and let's spin the wheel and it's it's just it's a nice way that because you never know who's going to be next and there's a level of excitement and anticipation when when someone's being drawn upon to ask a question so simple tools like that are, are really useful sorry Jason you somebody will also have a, a more intelligent question to ask no so let's open it out so anyone like to unmute and we still have things coming in the chat pane across here oh, um, so you have, you have read that, certainly. can i can i ask a question of course you, know how you, you mentioned a bit about people who uh, take over in a session and i've been at that say sometimes i am that person but sometimes i've been at a session where someone takes over do you have any tips of how to manage that person because they can spoil it for everyone else and it becomes very frustrating when you're the presenter because we're looking at for offering more workshops online and it becomes very frustrating when someone does dominate the conversation and it's really hard to to close them down without being offensive even in a face-to-face -face, it can be really difficult have you got any tips on how you can do that in an online so it, it, certainly within a classroom environment, that, that's why I've used things like a, a raised hand approach. So with everyone that has a raised hand, you're explaining, right, I'm, I'm going to go through the class. I'm going to make sure that everyone has a turn to speak. So essentially, you, you're getting beyond that point of this, the person who wants to dominate and answer for everything. Because basically, they've all got one chance and they've got a chance to speak. And sometimes I tell people, like, if you get, get in there early, <laughs> use your turn if you're embarrassed. You know, choose a topic that you, you can actually contribute to. But it, it does equalize. It has that additional effect of, of spreading out the engagement. And, and people don't usually want to be last to answer because they, they can't then choose the answer that they're going to respond to. So sometimes that's, that's a tactic. I also like to explain that we have a limited amount of time. And I, I be upfront and I say, look, 
this is for everyone. We're all in this together and I'm interested in hearing from everyone. And that's, that's something you would face in a face-to-face -face class or, or an online session. Um, but I, I think it's a very valid point. I think the phrase, I'd like to hear from for everyone, you've got one more minute. It's very hard to argue with not hearing from everyone. And, and then by the time you get down to a countdown towards the end, you're forcing the person to come to a conclusion. And I, I like the tip about the, having the participation list and ticking off how often, because then you can easily see the person that is engaging or not engaging. Thank you. There's a question from Fiona. I feel Jason has a good one for this. In online meetings, how much should the chair be speaking? Uh, that's a different technique from teaching in a class. I think the chair has to be very adaptable and again as a skill chairing a meeting I think is a, a one which is underrated and um, one that uh, I think is lends itself to continual improvement. I think it very much depends on each circumstance and um, I, I've chaired quite a lot of meetings and there's ones where I've been able to sit back and do nothing and everyone has contributed beautifully uh, from their perspective and uh, and it's wonderful and then there's others where I spend my time uh, I suppose the biggest challenge is as Fiona you um, alluded to one person trying to dominate the proceedings especially when someone's quite aggressive about it um, and where everyone's very passionate and trying to come to a, a direction of travel um, is, is difficult um, I think about it is those human skills of empathy but uh, being straightforward and honest about what needs to be achieved as well and not being around the bush. So it could be uh, the, the phrase, uh, we, we need to include everyone so, and we need to, to and we appreciate everyone's time. So you've got one minute to finish up. Could you get to your main point? I think it's um, a, a blunt way of putting it, but it needs to be said. So I think it, it, it's about being adaptable and responsive uh, rather than having a set view as to how sharing needs to, ha to happen. Well, with that, I think we'll bring the formal proceedings to a close, this one on uh, online uh, meetings, um, managing online sessions. Um, thank you very much for the participation and the questions. And with that, um, I'll conclude the formal part.